Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jérôme Delay, and I'm the head of the entertainment division at Twin Midem, and it's a pleasure to welcome all of you to this MIPCOM 2013 and this keynote address. Today, it's an honor for me to welcome Ryan Kavanagh, founder and CEO of Relativity Media. Ryan is a chief executive officer of Relativity, a next generation studio engaged in multiple aspects of entertainment, including film and television financing, production and distribution, music publishing, sport management, fashion management, and digital media. Under Ryan's leadership, Relativity has produced, distributed, or structured financing of for nearly 200 Martian pictures, generating over $22 billion in worldwide box office revenues and earning 73 Oscar nomination. Relativity Television is one of the largest suppliers of unscripted television programs in the US and is currently expanding in scripted series. Ryan will take us beyond the scene of an emerging studio that is breaking down the barrier between film and TV. He will share his unique approach to financing and developing film properties and how his studio leverages his properties to develop scripted and unscripted TV shows that appeal to both American and international audience. After his speech, Ryan will be interviewed by Alexandra Suic, media editor of The Economist. But with no further ado, please join me in welcoming founder and CEO of Relativity Media, Ryan Kavanagh. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. First, uh, I'd like to thank MIPCOM for inviting me to this year's event, and Jerome for the kind and amazing introduction. He's definitely inflated my ego a bit already. Um, I'd also just like to take a moment to point out a very special guest we have here, who as of two days ago is the ex-president of the General Assembly of the UN, Vuk. Maybe we can have a light on Vuk and a, a little bit of a round of applause for him. Uh, so I was asked to come here today to speak about how to convert a feature film into to a television show. And there's really a simple answer. It's evolution and adaptation. You see, each time a new technology platform has been introduced, whether that's TV evolving from classic cinema, cable evolving from network TV, DVD evolving from VHS, and so on and so forth, we have an in, as an industry have had to adapt and evolve to survive. And I believe that right now, this very moment, with the rise of TV everywhere, as we keep hearing it, we are at perhaps the most pivotal moment the industry has ever seen. And so, in order to understand how to take movies and convert them into television, it's also important to understand where television, and all of content for that matter, is headed. And that's something that I call the theory of everything. But before we jump in, Let's go back to a time a long, long time ago when everything was much simpler. 2010. <laughs> These are the top 10 grossing films in 2010. And we made exactly none of these. But that's OK, because I don't want to talk about any of those. Or those. Or those. Or those. Or those. It's right there. Catfish. Uh, by the way, we did make a lot of those movies up there, but uh, that's not what we're here to talk about. <laughs> We're here to talk about the 161st uh, grossing film of the year, Catfish. And by a show of hands, how many of you here saw Catfish? OK, so that's about how many all of France saw. So um, thank you for our $14,000. Um, as you can see, it did $3.2 million in the US and a whopping $240,000 international. While the movie actually was profitable for us, which a little later I'll explain, because it plays back into how this works for TV, by all traditional measures, box office gross, opening weekend, this movie was a big underperformer. By the way, just as a side note, the fact that we still use these outdated metrics like opening weekend, number one, box office, uh, as, a, as a measurement of success in the movie business is something that's uh, discerning um, and definitely needs to be changed, but hopefully that'll be next year's topic. <laughs> but for now, let's, let's fast forward from 2010 to 2012, two years later. That's two years after when Catfish hit television. 
On that day, the television show premiered, and as you can see, it was stuck between some show called Teen Mom and what I can only imagine is all night seven hours of Jersey Shore. And when the numbers came in, the world was pretty staggered. But I can say, and I don't mean this in an egotistical way, we were not staggered, nor were we surprised. We had the highest rated 11 p.m. premiere in MTV's history, their biggest premiere in more than five years, and we had over 2.6 million viewers that night. And by the time season one was over, Catfish was the number one cable show of 2012 and the highest rated cable show on Monday nights. And this was a show that was remarkably consistent, 2.4 million plus average viewers. And week to week, it never once dipped below 2 million viewers. We're currently about three quarters through season two, and with the numbers remaining as strong as ever, we're entering into season three, and it doesn't stop there. We've also taken the show international. Earlier this year, MTV Networks announced around the world that it's starting airing season one. Um, and in some cases, like in the UK, it actually is pulling bigger numbers than in the United States. And we're not just selling the previously aired episodes, we're actually taking the format and selling it to new markets. As you can see, like, the Mexico, like Mexico and the UK, which is unprecedented for a season one show or a show of this type. As we speak, actually, the UK and Mexico are in pre-production on their own version of Catfish. We're also currently in negotiations in a number of other countries, and I expect Catfish to be a pretty global brand around the world. So the question is, how did this happen? How does a film that made $3.2 million in the United States and $240,000 in the foreign markets turn into one of the biggest cable television shows in the world? And maybe more to the point, how do we know this would happen? The short answer is that I actually had an epiphany after this film was released, which I'll talk about later. But the long answer is actually that Catfish is a result of us continuing to look for, at, at, for ways and at ways to innovate and adapt as the TV and film windows collapse together into one another. And so I believe that the success has everything to do with our model, which is a little bit unique to the industry and actually evidenced by hard data. But to show you what I mean, and actually back into where we come from, we need to go way back this time to 1916. <laughs> 1916, this is when most of today's film studios were founded. And to be honest, not much has changed since then. The numbers have gotten bigger, but the model's basically the same. And not only are these studios behind the curve in innovation, the risk-reward profile for their movies is also very old world. It doesn't help that traditional media still judges success by box office opening and opening weekends, or that the studios don't share any profit or loss data on their films. But the 100-year-old established physical and structural system makes it impossible for them to do what we did with a film like Catfish. And let me show you what I mean. Let's say that these studios want to make a $50 million film. Now, of course, we all know they don't make $50 million films. If it doesn't cost $200 million, a studio doesn't want to make it. But we need to be able to use this to compare it to our model. So after paying for the production of the film, the next big source for these studios is the cost of owning and shooting on their own lots. While 40 or 400 acres in California in the center of LA may have been cheap 100 years ago, it's not today. But they have to pay for these lots no matter what. So even if they're not shooting on them, they're still paying for them. Next is domestic distribution. The old studios, or in fact their parent companies, own all aspects of domestic distribution, which leads into things like owning their own editing-based digital agencies and affiliate networks, um, inflating the domestic distribution costs by utilizing their own systems versus the uh, properly, mo properly monetized system. Foreign distribution is another huge cost, as these studios um, did very well. In the beginning and up through the last hundred years, they basically opened up in every foreign country, sent, uh, picked up big buildings, sent in thousands or hundreds of people, and created enormous infrastructure, which I like to call the electric meter, that's always turning, needing to put out movies. Not to mention that they also have to fund 100% of the P&A in the foreign markets, which is another 40 to $80 million. So for a $50 million film, what you see here is the studios end up taking on $170 million of risk before they know if they're getting one penny back. You can imagine what that means on a $200 million film. 
So looking at this model, the closest comparative that I actually can make is venture capital. And in venture capital, generally about 85% of your investments lose money, 15% break even or make a little profit, and 5% are the big, big successes. And that's exactly the model of the movie business. 85% on average lose money, 15% break even to make money, and 5% they need to be blockbusters. Everybody needs to see them. That's the old model. To use a baseball analogy, they are swinging for the fences every single time. And if you're not familiar with baseball, it just means that the risk they take on is that they need to have the biggest hits just to stay in the game. As many of you know, Relativity got started financing other studios' films, so I got to see firsthand how they do it. So when we started making films in 2004, we developed kind of a new model, a model that we believed better managed the risk-reward profile for film which carried over when we launched our own distribution in 2010 and ultimately led to what we can do in TV today. We were almost 100 years behind the other studios, but there were definitely benefits to getting a late start. It meant that we had no legacy issues and we could afford to do things a little bit differently. So what did we do differently? After analyzing the film asset class, we actually realized that the closest comparative to film is real estate, not venture capital. You wouldn't want to go build a gigantic commercial complex, a property, put tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions into it, without knowing that you had a large anchor tenant like Carrefour or Walmart to help offset the costs before you started building. So this is how good, good real estate developers limit their risk. Before they build, they know their anchor tenants. So we take a similar approach to film. First, we don't take on any of the costs of our foreign distribution. We partner up. In a, right now in 117 countries with long-term partnerships that are true evolving building partnerships that share the risk of the film, which cuts, our, cut, cuts the risk of the film by 70 to 75% and enables us to not have to fund 30 to $60 million of foreign p and These are our anchor tenants. These are our Walmarts and our Carrefours. And because these distributors are local, it's our opinion, and because we've worked with them and they've done such a good job for us that they actually end up getting better results because of their relationships as a benefit of being a local company. Beyond that, we take a proactive approach and take advantage of tax incentives and tax credits and rebates. So we shoot in locations where we can maximize our dollar. And if tax credits and tax incentives don't exist in the locations we want to shoot, we create them. We were if not the, certainly a key driver in the creation of the bill in Montreal, which has rebated us over $50 million in two films. Puerto Rico, we helped push through the last bill. We're the first ones to use it. New Mexico, we helped set up the training program, and now Hawaii for two years. So again, that cuts risk by another 15%. And this means that we don't own lots. We don't carry the risk that comes with lots. We don't have the huge overhead. So when all is said and done, we eliminate somewhere between 95 and 100% of the risks of the film before the first ticket is sold. In fact, before the film even starts production. So when you compare us to the old studios, it looks something like this. And this is why we're able to make the films we do. And unlike the VC style approach, instead of 85% of our films losing and needing to have home runs, we actually make a profit on 85% of our films and we don't ever project to have a home run. And it's because of a mo this model that we can make films like Catfish and create them into TV shows. And instead of losing tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars, as you would under the old studio model had you made a film like Catfish, we actually can earn a, uh, we actually can earn a modest profit on it, which you'll soon see is actually a big factor in allowing us to convert film to television. So in building our own studio and our own slate, we're actually able to create a very diverse set of films each year. We can make movies with all different kinds of budgets and all different kinds of target audiences. And because of our model, most of our films can also be television shows. And here's why. If you think about today's blockbuster model, it requires that successful films appeal to a very broad audience. So those 180, the 180 million dollars of risk a studio takes or larger on bigger films need the entire audience or very large segments to show up for success. There's no place for films that appeal to only one demographic, no matter how desirable that demographic may be. But with our model, 
our films can appeal to a demographic and still be successful like a TV show. And so we realized that our film properties could be more than just profitable movies, but in fact, they are perhaps the greatest TV pilots ever known. So we distribute somewhere between 10 and 15 films each year. But the interesting dynamic of that is that due to exit polling, market testing, market research, and the physical presence of the audience, we collect such an incredible amount of data on the people who see our movies. We know the audience's demographic, age, genders, likes, dislikes, what aspects of the stories they enjoyed, what characters they embraced, what characters they didn't like, what they would have changed in the characters. If they eat popcorn, do they like Diet Coke or Coke? Are they Pepsi fans? <laughs> in fact, we probably have 10 times the data of, for, on our films of any TV pilot that any TV pilot has ever had in history. And beyond this, further data actually tells us how big our particular niche of films is in home viewing. This is actually where our films shine. So if you look at the industry data, you can see that the big blockbuster films are actually selling less and less DVDs every day in Blu-rays. We all hear about the drop of DVD. We're all aware that it's dropping. You know, there was a big drop. Now it continues to drop slowly. The interesting thing, which many people probably don't know, is that while big blockbuster films are dropping between 3 and 10% a year in DVD, the films that we make in the 20 to 80 million dollar budget or in, in 20 to 80 million dollar box office range is actually the only segment in DVD that's growing by 20% a year. So if you look, our films convert on a GBO basis of 1.33 to the industry average of 1.09. So of all the other major major studios, we are the highest conversion rates from box office to home video which just says that viewers like our product at home. And so when you, have audience, when you have films like ours, the audiences continue to grow, actually, after the film has been released, after it's been in theaters, and we've got a built-in audience condition to watch these properties at home. So let's talk about Catfish. So in the TV and film industry, I, I'm sure many of you have dealt with this, we've all had projects that were successful, and we've all had projects that were not. And one of those things that really used to frustrate me is when people would walk up to tell me how much they loved that movie that happened to be one that didn't work. In fact, it seemed like that happened a lot more often with the ones that didn't work than the ones that did. And at the time, I was absolutely sure people would walk into my office, tell me how much they loved the film, turn around and get in the elevator, and then tell their friend how much they hated the film. <laughs> and as with other films, when Catfish came out, there was one big difference. The same thing happened. But there was a little difference, actually. This time, the group of people who were telling this to me were actually friends' kids, were nephews, nieces, high school kids, kids 15 to 23, kids who I know when I was 15 to 23, I wouldn't tell someone that I liked a movie that I didn't. I spoke my mind. And that's what led to the epiphany. Based on what I was hearing about Catfish and based on the target group, I went back to look at all of our movies that I would call under, underperformers. And I started thinking about the different groups that had told me they liked the films, that I assumed they were just uh, being nice. And in fact, when I did the research, I realized that actually maybe they did like the films because it was a very specific group of people telling me that. In the case of Catfish, 15 to 23 year olds. In the case of many other movies, it could be older males, it could be younger males, it could be a different uh, demographic. So we looked even more closely at Catfish. We looked at how many movie tickets did we sell. How many Blu-rays did we sell? How many people bought it on demand? How much sell-through? And how much money we had already invested in marketing the film? With, with millions of 15 to 25-year-olds who had invested in Catfish and tens of millions of dollars spent on marketing, it became obvious that this film was basically one of the best pilots that had come out yet. By spending 15 or 20 million dollars on marketing and already having six or seven million people invested into this film, we had literally tested the market. And not just that, we had more market data on what they liked and what they didn't like about the film than any other television show could have in history. And if we could just convert 20 to 30% of the audience that had already invested into this into a television show, then we knew we'd have one of the biggest shows on cable. And so that's what we did. But we didn't stop there. If we could translate underperforming films into highly successful shows, then what about highly successful films? the ones that did appeal to a broader audience. 
If you run the same analysis that I just did on a movie like Limitless, which opened up number one at the box, not that we care about number one, <laughs> and made over 170 million at the box, not that we actually care about box, um, the potential is big. Limitless is more than just a, su a successful film when I look at it now. It's probably the single biggest television pilot in history, with more than 20 million viewers invested. And if Catfish can be the biggest new show of all time on cable, then imagine what could happen with Limitless. Once again, we have 10 times the data on the market than on any other pilot. And if you include the DVD and ancillary marketing, 50 million spent on marketing domestic and probably another 50 million spent marketing on foreign. No TV show has ever had that amount of marketing. With even a fraction of the conversion metrics of what happened with Catfish, Limitless could be one of the biggest network shows that's ever been seen. Now, I'm sure there's all the cynics in the room, and you may be asking yourselves, well, how do we know that Catfish wasn't just a great show, a good idea, attracted a lot of viewers without, without the help of the film, because word of mouth was great. Well, opening night, there was 2.69 million viewers. So that was all the evidence we needed. They came because of the movie, and the show was good enough to keep them. I should tell you that this way of, pro of thinking, it may sound like common sense to many of you. It's actually completely foreign to the other studios. And this is something that will not change anytime soon due to the legacy structures of the studios. You see, most studios keep their TV and film departments in separate buildings, separate P&Ls, separate offices. In fact, they run like two separate companies. Many of you already know this, some of you may not. Um, and they also have their completely separate reporting structures. So think about it. You're in charge of a film in a major studio. You just greenlit your $180 million film, and it fails. Are you going to actually hand that property over to the head of TV to let him go make a successful television show so that you can be embarrassed? Or is the head of TV going to actually make it into a television show on the chance that whoever's running the parent company is going to say, wait, wait, you took a losing movie, and now you made a losing TV show? But let's take the reverse. What if your film's successful? Am I going to take my huge franchise and say, mm, I'm going to take it off my P&L and give it to TV? Therefore, this model is stuck. So at Relativity, we've completely rejected that idea, the TV and film were at odds. We believe that now more than ever, we actually have to start with the content itself, regardless of the format, and then work together to find the best ways to deliver the content to, the, to as many audience members as possible. And for many of our films, that means television and beyond. So as you can see, we've been building content divisions to supply new content in what we consider to be every major category. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but for now, let's stick to film and television. So back to television. We have no intention of stopping with Catfish. With hit movies like Immortals, Limitless, Act of Valor, we also had TV in mind before releasing these films. We looked at them not just as films, but as big TV pilots tailored the content to make sure that it would appeal both to national and international TV audiences, and looking for ways to leverage our film audience for television. In fact, as you may have heard, we announced earlier this week that the first of these shows has been acquired, Act of Valor, will be distributed by Nat Geo, and is going into production now. We also announced earlier this week that Limitless is uh, turning into a TV show, independently financed with over 26 million viewers in the franchise and a substantial high like. All of our data shows that, uh, we're ex that this show should be very large and we're extremely excited about its potential. Once again, Limitless, the movie we consider to be one of the greatest pilots in history. But by the way, we're not the only ones. Some of the biggest stars in the world are now recognizing this potential of film crossing over into TV, which brings us to our next piece of news which is that Bradley Cooper will be executive producing this show, and who knows, may even be in the first episode. We believe that Limitless really does have the potential to be the biggest TV show on TV, but we also know that TV, again, isn't the only place that the show will need to go. As we all know, the days when TV was in a box, that was in your living room, and told you what to watch when you want to watch it are pretty much long gone. Just putting a show on television and hoping that people will find the show is a losing strategy, especially if it's not connected to content that you already know, like movies. And so we believe that, first of all, our, show, our shows like Limitless and Active Valor already have a significant advantage on TV because of the branding. 
But let's look at the other side of the world. Let's look at what, I don't know if, many, if everybody's familiar with the, the uh, analogy up at the cord cutters, the people who don't pay for television. If you look at the data, there is a segment of the population much bigger than you think and only getting bigger that are in the cord cutting. I often either am involved in or see debates between people who are running MSOs or cable networks or networks and those who are somehow involved in what we call the you know, TV everywhere uh, uh, type digital distribution platform as to if and when and how TV everywhere is coming. And in fact, in my opinion, I, I have a little secret. I think TV everywhere is here. Let's just look at the current market stats. 9% of the US homes have never paid for television. Cable, satellite, none of the above. And on top of that, another 11% have cut the cord. They've canceled their subscriptions. They don't pay for anything. That means that one out of five American homes do not pay for any form of traditional television. And then when you factor in the market studies that 45% of people say that cable is overvalued and 30% are currently at risk of canceling, it's obvious that TV everywhere or non-cable, however we want to term it, is here. But it's not like these cord cutters are dropping off the grid. They're just consuming content from a different source and in a different way. And these viewers are actually changing the very way that television is consumed. They want what they want, when they want it, and they want to be able to get it how they want it, and they want to pay what they want to pay for it. Some of them are willing to live with fewer content options. They go to Radio Shack, they buy a digital antenna for 50 bucks, they plug it in, they get 15 free channels. Others, whatever they can get for free. Some pay a la carte. Some pay $10 a month for program content, and others some combination thereof. But here's the other thing. Viewers don't want to just watch episodic television. They want to watch everything this way. Every day, people are renting movies through their Apple TVs. They're, they're paying subscription fees for exclusive access to behind the scenes, content from their favorite musicians, athletes, short form, long form. They're paying money to watch other people play video games. And we as an industry have not kept up with the way viewers view content. While TV focuses on long form, these viewers don't see any distinction. Long form, short form, sketch, anything, it's all the same for them. To them, it's all just content they want to consume. So we believe that if these viewers could build their own TV everywhere experience, it would look something like this. And this is an amazing opportunity for anybody who can produce and host an entire, we'll call it an MCN, if you will, another buzzword of the time, worth of content. Take relativity, for instance, not that I'm biased. What if we could take every one of our films and make them available to viewers in perpetuity? And by the way, we'd be the only studio in the world that's able to do that, given that the way we built our platform and distribution in today's world does not have the same prohibitions that other studios have of pulling their films off of other TV platforms. Or what if we could take all of our television shows after they've run on live TV and made them available. 31 series on the air right now. What if we had 50 pilots that we've shot that are all done, never been seen anywhere, and ready to go into some type of NCN? And so it's quite simple with these. We could actually take 50 pilots and let the audience decide. Let the audience decide where it goes next. Does it go to cable? Does it go multi-series? Does it go to binge viewing? Does it go nowhere? And what if we could take all the content that we currently produce with our sports clients and share it all in that same place? As the second largest sports agency in the world, we have 400 of the world's top athletes, and we've consistently been putting five to 10 hours of programming out every week. Giving viewers kind of close and personal upfront access to their heroes and their idols. And not just interviews, fun content, acting, interacting, things that they can't get anywhere else. We've We've also created six long-form shows, reality shows, around the lives of these clients. This is the type of content that sports fans cannot get anywhere else. All you have is games or pre- and post-game interviews. And so part of TV, Relativity's TV Everywhere strategy could be unique sports content that can't be found anywhere else. Some of you may have heard recently that we announced something called M3, Relativity's fashion agency where we represent some of the largest fashion brands in the world. As we all know, fashion is a very highly consumed, highly desirable form of content. We all know that shows 
built around modeling, design, makeovers. They attract big audiences. It's a key part of television. And so just like our sports division, our fashion division can create a wide range of unique content and make it available to viewers outside of the traditional MSO model. And what about gaming? So gamers, and many of you may be surprised to hear this actually, because I was when I first learned it, gamers are consuming more and more content. In fact, there's a company called Major League Gaming. You'll see that more than two million viewers pay to go watch other people play video games online. Major League Gaming, Major League Gaming happens to be one of our partners as well. So what I'm here to tell you is that everything I just told you we could do, we are doing. We are ready right now to make all of our movies available. We have dozens of TV shows and 50 unaired shows. We have unique sports, fashion, and gaming content, and we have partnerships that allow us to feature numerous other categories on this channel, MSN, content provider, or whatever you want to call it. We have digital content that is not available anywhere else. And we have access to tens of millions of potential viewers through our Artist Direct Network and Rogue Movie Network. So this content platform is launching. We're in discussions with a number of different distributors, figuring out whether this will be exclusive or multi-platform. Our plan is actually to have this up and running in the next 12 months. So I realize that I probably just ruffled the feathers of a lot of the traditional TV community in here. But I want to be very clear about something. Our theory of, our, our theory of everything is not about replacing traditional TV. The debates I continue to hear about the future of TV everywhere are almost always either or, but they shouldn't be. Instead, these two experiences should coexist, as they already do. I want to go back to this slide for a second. 45% of viewers say they don't value cable TV. Well, what does that mean? It means that 55% of the viewers do value cable TV. These I'm calling the cord keepers. These are the people that want the luxury of having everything available to them. They're people that are willing to pay the extra for the six to 700 channels in addition to potentially using the other platforms, and I'm one of those people. And they want their content first run. They want to see their favorite shows on Wednesday at 8 p.m., and they won't miss an episode. I can tell you that my wife, sitting somewhere here in the audience, does not miss an episode of The Bachelor. I have to be home at 7.59 to watch it with her, and it drives me crazy. I know what you're, you know what I'm talking about, I see it. <laughs> so the cord keepers make up more than half the TV audience, and they're not going anywhere anytime soon. And the data is obvious. So we still believe that the power of first-run content on television will continue to supply the MSOs and the cable providers with great shows like Limitless, Act of Valor, and, and a lot of other big shows. But the distinction between cord keepers and cord cutters is really simple. The cord cutters don't care about first-run TV. They want to binge consume TV, and they want it when they want it. They don't care if it's one year later or five years later. How many of us have kids who said, I just watched 60 straight hours of Lost and it was amazing? I keep hearing that. I think Lost was off five years ago. Two completely different audiences with two completely different needs. This is the universe where we want to live. And I'm here to tell you that this is the universe that relativity is open for business in, both for TV and TV everywhere. Thank you. Which you chair choose. would you like? <laughs> Your chair. Thanks. I don't get to use this nifty button anymore. Sorry. Um, thanks for the presentation. I thought it was fun. Um, I think I'd like to start by asking you about this universe that you've just presented. And I think to kind of calm the audience down and make sure no one runs out, you've, you kind of suggest that everyone can cohabitate and that people will be fine either way. But in this scenario, who's going to feast and who's going to famine, do you think? Well, I think that's the whole point. I don't think there is feast and famine. I think that if the two worlds, and right now they are two separate worlds, you know, there are the guys who are, you know, what I'll call the MSO traditional providers, and then there's guys who are running with TV everywhere strategies, and they're both powerful. And I don't think that they, they need to be competing. I actually think that the coexistence is in that the viewer, the specific viewer, and the desires of that viewer, are very different. So the guy who, wants, who doesn't want to pay for cable or satellite and wants to use, whether it's you know, a TV or a model like ours, added with a Netflix or use a, you know, any other form of Hulu, is someone who doesn't actually care that much about first run. They care more about being able to watch it when they want to watch it. And I think if the two platforms can recognize that they actually can, can support each other, um, I think a lot like 
I mean, I, I to use not even use the. Uh, the, the distinction of VHS and DVD for at, a, at a certain time, you know, VHS and DVD, ultimately the studios thought DVD would be the death of VHS right. um, and be the death of them, and it actually turned into be the biggest growth for the studios ever. Same thing happened when television started showing um, film. Uh, in fact, it became a huge growth factor for them, and it was fought. So I think that they both coexist. Yeah, in fact, I think the studios used to call um, VHS the Grim Reaper that was fought heavily. They sure did. Um, speaking of technology um, and catalysts um, in the industry, if you had to name one company that's doing the most to disrupt the ecosystem as we know it, who would you name? That's a really good question. Uh, I think that um, it's probably right now, I mean, in terms of the, the way that the industry would see as the biggest disruptor, I would say, is Aereo. Hmm. And do you think the fear is rightly placed? For people who are not American, Aereo is a company that is basically offering people the opportunity to watch broadcast networks um, on, on their computer and DVR shows, but it's just, it's just broadcast networks so far. But do you think that the fear is rightly placed? Um, I actually don't. I think at the end of the day that if the, you know, I think obviously it's the broadcasters who are, who are most concerned at this point. I think that, again, um, it's, there's a world that, it coexists, as you see, you know, just from the statistics, there's 55% of the world that is not going to go by area. They're going to keep their box. And I think if the, instead of fighting it, and for those of you who don't know, this is going to go to the Supreme Court. This is a huge battle right now um, of content. I think instead of fighting it, if they work together on it, actually the cablers and the MSOs and the networks could all find that way to coexist between the two. Sure. Um, what you started the presentation with was talking about movies as great pilots. Um, if you carry that analogy forward, there's a lot of pilots that don't get made into series. So aren't there some movies that do, will not work on oh, as yeah. television series? Uh, uh, we're not going to have 15 television you know, shows a year that come off our movies. It's probably about five to six. So, you know, What works, what doesn't, do you think? Are there certain well, features that will work in a movie or not that do work on television? I mean, I think if all the characters die at the end of a movie, you probably can't have a series. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, Safe bet. You know, obviously, if you think, well, for us, the reason if you looked at Active Valor or Limitless, these are things, you know, they, they, we, made, we made them for movies with the idea of translating television. So Limitless, what better than the idea of you take a pill, you unlock 100% of your brain, and, you know, you're basically you can go do whatever you want. I mean, right. that you can go anywhere with that. Or Active Valor, which is, you know, you, you basically following whether it's the Navy SEALs or whether it's, you know, the SWAT or Army and following real stories that are made a little bit fictitious with a little fiction in it. Basically, all you got to do is, is, is read the press and you got a new story every day like a Law & Order or CSI. Um, I don't think you can go take, you know, Mirror Mirror and keep a Snow White story going. Right, right. Okay. Um, you guys are known in the industry as the math men. Basically, you take risk modeling very seriously. It's what, 10,000 inputs that you put in to try and figure out whether or not a film will do well and whether you should green light it? It's 10,000 outputs, but outputs. Yeah, it runs 10,000 scenarios. OK, so 10,000 scenarios. What are maybe two or three factors that you would be considering when you're thinking about risk with television? Um, well, first of all, so to be clear, it's not a green light model. People um, often mistake that we use math to green light movies, which is not how we do it. It's about trying to figure out what will make it to the next stage. Correct. Right, so it's a, it's a combination of creative and financial. So sure. we definitely use a model. It runs through characteristics like, you know, you know the, the, whether the, the movie stars are A-list or B-list or where they are in their career, the directors, the producers, the release date, the genres, um, you know, the average viewing audience, the weather, the cities. And they, those all go in and run 10,000 iterations and basically tell us what percentage of the time the movie would make money and how much. Mm -hmm. And that is just a check the box. If it passes through that, it doesn't mean we're making the movie. It just means it's passed through a financial model and actually goes through a normal creative process. Um, if, if it says, you know, 15% of the time it made money, it's probably not going to the creative process. Sure. Um, the difference is with, with TV, it's the reverse. We have all the statistics before we go to TV. Mm -hmm. We already know what the audience liked, specifically within that content. We already know what they liked about the characters, what they didn't like, what, who the demographics are. So we know kind of what channel it should be on, what target audience it should be, just because we have so, you know, I mean, we probably spend more money, and I'm not joking, on market testing our movies than probably the network spend on making their entire pilot. Right. So, you know, we actually go in with that, we don't have to go model against 
you know, other shows, okay. we actually have our own modeling on the show itself. Okay, fair enough. So you're not going to run a completely different scenario for television and how it would appear, because presumably it is a different audience, time of day, network would matter significantly, right? Right, well, that's, we are, so we have that information. So we knew, that's why you take Catfish. We knew it was 15 to 23-year-olds. You know, we knew exactly uh, males and females. So we know it's MTV. You know, you got to know the time slot, so on and so forth. And the same thing, you know, will happen with all of our shows, which is we can walk in with, you know, stacks of documents saying, this is who liked it, this is who's going to show for sure, maybe you get other people, but this is the target audience, this is the programming, here's its size. 92% of them loved it, you know, around the world, and we actually, I mean, legitimately have more data on what, what the show demographic and show success should be than, you know, you would even modeling on movies from representing other movies. But it sounds a lot like what Netflix says and also what Amazon says about having user data to then decide what to, which shows to go uh, forward with. And one of the things that um, Roy Price said in his presentation yesterday was um, about the importance of voting for pilots. So I'm curious kind of how you see that evolving. Like what's the say that viewers are going to have going well, forward? Well, I think that, you know, we're a little bit of a different model. I think that, um, you know, obviously Net Netflix and Amazon, I think Net Netflix actually with, with um, House of Cards was the perfect representation of that there are two completely o different audiences. They put House of Cards in and everybody binge viewed that. And you know, it, it, it goes from, from, from kind of first run on one side to second run on the other. And it shows the coexistence perfectly. Mm -hmm. That being said, what they're doing is they're using the user data that they garner from, from viewing activity and then decide how to make shows around that. And, um, and I think that you know, that's similar to what we do in film, which is we're garnering past film kind of uh, uh, analytics and deciding what other films to make. Ours is the opposite for TV because we've already got the statistics on that specific um, uh, piece of property. So in Limitless, we already know who liked it and what they want. So we don't need the, the audience to tell us any further. Right. Do, you, do they want it? Because they've told us they so want it. So are you it. skeptical of kind of the participate, the model of participation with viewers? Will that actually yield? quality shows, do you think, in the future? Um, I don't know that I'm skeptical. I think it depends on how they're garnering the data and um, you know, how they're, uh, you know, obviously there's such a diverse audience. I think if it goes after a target audience, then, then it's probably going to work. Sure. I think it'll start to be a problem if they're trying to make, use that to make big shows because you know, you're going to get very different feedback from you know, the under 25-year-old females than you are from the, the over 50-year-old males. So you know, it, it, it's really about how wide are you trying to go. Sure. Um, on the online video com question and these disruptors like Amazon and Netflix, how, how long do you think it's going to take for really serious money to be invested in online content? And everyone points to House of Cards and the $100 million figure. That is kind of, it's one of, one of a kind, ultimately. A lot of the budgets are much lower. How long until we see Hollywood taking this seriously? Um, well, first of all, I don't know that it's, it, it, well, Hollywood, I think, is already somewhat taking it seriously. But I don't know that it's Hollywood that's going to actually be the provider. You know, when you look at it, Google just announced the Google stick, you have Amazon, you have Roku, you have Hulu, you have um, uh, Xbox, you know. So but won't it be Hollywood still providing the content? Well, so first of all, Hollywood still, you know, they make movies and obviously those movies, they want to be on as many platforms as possible and they are. You're starting to see them on more and more platforms. So they'll use it as obviously a platform for their films. Television, as I said, I think big, you know, hit shows still probably will go first run on cable, on, net, uh, on network, on prime. And then ultimately those platforms, are, they're buying them now. You know, they buy, they'll buy second run or third run. Um, you know, in terms of actually programming content specifically for, you know, a platform, um, unless they own it, I don't actually think is going to happen for a long time. I think that the, con the, the, the Amazons of the world, the Googles of the world, the Xboxes of the world have huge budgets to go out and either pay a third party to be their content creator um, you know, and, and, and find a home that actually, you know, can create all forms of content or just go out broad and buy lots of content. Sure. Um, let's go to your point about Windows collapsing and that changing. How, how will this evolve and how do the um, subscription video on demand players play into this? Kind of what's your vision in maybe two, three years? So the near term of, of where the kind of theatrical and television windows are going to be? Sure. Well, you know, look, the windows every day change. I mean, it's funny because uh, our head of TV sales, you know, every, I gotta, every week I walk into his office and I, I say, can I have the TV window in? Or, I mean, the windowing, because it changes literally like week by week. Yeah. So, you know, as we're starting to look at windowing, the chart is literally changing, you know, like on, on a real time basis. But that's because the studios are much more willing to experiment, isn't it? And the networks too. Or where, where, why do you think they're changing? I think so that, you know, 
it's changing itself, meaning that, you know, when people go and put a movie out, you know, a perfect example was when Lionsgate went out and did, um, did uh, arbitrage, you know, day and date, and I think they made a lot more on home video than they did, I mean, on, on digital than they mm -hmm. did theatrical. You know, people, you know, that are willing to experiment on a small scale start showing you there is a model there. That being said, I don't believe that there will be in the near term a collapse of the windows day and date between big theatrical movies and big day and date on, uh, you know, on a, some type of digital platform. I think that the, it'll eat too much into the margins and the marketing platform is necessary to actually be in theaters first. But I do believe that the collapse of subscription and um, uh, you know, download on transaction and you know, a lot of original content just coming directly through the kind of cord cutting you know, world, if you will, I think in two or three years, it's 50% of the audience. Hmm. What's um, a, fun, a qu fun question for you? What's a movie that's not a relativity movie, but one you would like to be uh, made into a TV series? What's the movie you'd most like to see on television? Well, that's a good question. Um, probably, uh, God, that'd be, that'd be hard to say. Most favorite movie to make in that's not one of our movies. Um, I mean, I'm such a hopeless romantic. It's uh, you know, I, uh, old movies that people wouldn't know, and I don't even know how it would be made into a TV series. But I'd say Casablanca, uh, somewhere in time. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. I like that. <laughs> Bring back Christopher Reeves and Jane Seymour. <laughs> I like that. I like that. I well, I think we'll leave it there if that's okay. I think some of the audience members might have questions, but we're gonna wrap up. But you are going to be able to ask them on Twitter because um, you're hosting a Q&A right now. So it's hashtag Relativity at MIP. Um, and thank you so much thank you. for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Do I, am I doing this hosting thing back there? Or We're here? doing it. All back right. There. Good to know. You're thank released. you, everybody. Thank you.